What's up, guys? Welcome back to Storytime with Uncle Reddit. My name's John, and this is r slash Tales from Tech Support. A little bit of a weird day. Been in the kitchen a lot today, making dinner ahead of time for everybody and cleaning up dishes and uh, feeling pretty domestic today. Anyway, not a whole lot of new stuff to report, so uh, let's do some tech support. Legacy tickets not for you. User here. I don't file many tickets, but recently I needed to follow up on an old one. I went to the web portal for old tickets and couldn't see some of the past ones I knew should be there, so I filed a ticket about that. After the automated email response, I couldn't see that ticket in the web portal either. Two weeks later, an email response from ITS. All communication and updates are completed through email only. Only ITS staff have access to the ticketing system via the web. Well, my overly sarcastic response. At the bottom of your message to me, the user, it's the following. You can view the ticket here. View item details, blah, blah, blah in browser, and the link goes to blank such ticketing system on the web. It's always been this way. From ITS. We removed that option. Wasn't communicated to the entire department. An old template that needs to be updated. Disregard moving forward. But then I got to wondering, what happened to my old ticket? Very clever. How will we ever know if their ticket clearance rate is what they say it is? Seems like a simple fix to me. If you no longer have the ticketing system available to users on the website, then maybe that link should be taken out of the email? I'm not sure the user needs access to be able to see this stuff, but maybe? I don't know. It depends on the company. I, I have no context, so I couldn't answer any of those questions that I have rattling around in my little pea brain here, but I would think if you're not going to give access, take the links away, take the description away. If you're going to let them have access, then fix whatever broke. Today I made my DBA laugh at a database issue 15 plus years in the making. This year has been a banner year for me when it comes to solving old problems that have plagued my company for years, and today's no exception. Today, in the process of solving the immediate issue at hand, I tackled the underlying issue. Man, I can't talk today. I tackled the underlying issue, which as far as I can tell has been a problem since at least 15 years ago. So today I noticed that one of my SQL jobs failed. Having experienced failures with this particular job before, I knew it was probably a disk space issue. Makes sense, since the job that failed was the daily database backup job. I checked the disk space, and sure enough, 13 megabytes free on the 450 gigabyte SQL DB drive, database drive. Delete out a bunch of old backups, now we're up to 250 gigabytes free. Yay! But when I was looking through the backups, one set of backups for one particular database called staging area was 40 gigabytes for each daily backup file. Check the database itself, 110 gigabytes. This database had been pretty big already before, but now it's just getting ridiculous. So I decided that today is the day I'm going to fix whatever's causing this once and for all. Tried to shrink the database in the log files, no difference. So I start running some reports on it to see what the issue might be. Decide to run a disk usage by table report. Oh God. One particular table in this database, TBL contacts has checks number, rechecks number, 1.6 billion records, holy cow. So I call up my contact at our MSP, who is not just our main point of contact there, but he's also a damn good database admin. And I'm like, dude, can you help me figure out what I'm looking at here? I can't even run queries on this table because it's so friggin' huge. He looks at the email I sent him with the screenshot of the report and immediately starts laughing hysterically. That's a great sign. All right, so let me explain a little bit about how this process is supposed to be working. Our company has websites that our clients use to keep track of the current inventory of merchandise they have on hand at each location. Every week they report to us how much merch they have left so we can then determine how much we need to send them each week to keep them from running out. This information used to exist on an external web host. To get the data from the web server imported into our internal system, we had an SQL server integration services package that would run once an hour, downloading the data from the website into a staging area database and making minor manipulations to it before inserting the new information into our main database for our internal management application. An outgoing SSIS package would also run that did the same thing in reverse, sending updated internal information out to the web server database via the middleman staging area database. Since we've moved everything under one roof with our MSP, we now have everything on the same SQL server, but these packages still run because we haven't had the time or the manpower to rewrite them. I'm just one man, legitimately. I've been the only IT person in the company for the past six years. And one step inside of one of these packages is where the problem lies. 
as the specific package that sends data from the internal database to one of the website databases is missing one important line from an SQL script embedded in it. The very first step in that package is to delete all the important data tables from the staging area database, then copy the ones from the internal database in their place. Only the script that deletes all the tables doesn't include a line to delete TBL contacts. So instead of deleting that table and replacing it, the SSIS package just reinserts all the data again. Normally this wouldn't be an issue except that the staging area version of this table doesn't have a primary key, as staging area is just a go-between database and it needs to keep the contact ID value from the original table. Unfortunately, due to this table not having a primary key, it also means that you can insert the exact same data into the table multiple times. The TBL contacts table in the internal database has grown from about 2,000 records originally to just over 150,000 records which are apparently being reinserted into the staging area database each time this process runs six times a day. Back to today, me and my friend at the MSP eventually get a query to run on that table and confirm that we are in fact getting multiple inserts of the exact same data, 11,000 times to be exact. The main reason no one caught it before was the next step in the job is to update the existing records in the web database and only insert new ones. Since the reinserted records all continued to have the same contact ID, they didn't show up as new, and therefore the job didn't import them into the web database. So the web database has the correct number of records, and thus hasn't ballooned in size like staging area has. And that's how you get the largest database table my DBA friend had ever seen in his life, to the point where he just burst out in laughter when he saw how many records were in it. Edit, just a brief update. I truncated the table and reran the job to import the data. Here are the results. The database is down from 110 gigabytes to 900 megabytes. The job went from taking an hour and 20 minutes to run to two minutes and 47 seconds. All in a good day's work. I'm not exactly sure what's going on here, but I think the closest thing I can equate it to is, it's like my wife. My wife used to have a problem with clothes. She would sort of forget that she had certain articles of clothing and then go out and buy new ones that matched the ones she had basically replacing it with the same exact one, but the old ones weren't going anywhere, so basically she's putting the same one in the closet over and over and over. Am I getting warmer? I've known some people that have done this with shoes. I've done it with tools, personally. You know, I know I've got a certain specialized drill bit somewhere, but, you know, it's going to take too long to find it, so I go out and buy another one. Sometimes I forget that I own some other specialized bit or tool or blade or something, and then I go buy another one, and as soon as I go to put it away where it belongs... Look at that. There's one already there. <laughs> so now this is, this is human error of the worst kind, at least with the database. Like you said, you were the only one that's been there doing any kind of IT stuff for six years. So, you know, you can only get to so much in a day. So fair enough. Noticing something like that is going to be a little tougher than just me putting an identical tool where there's already one existing or my wife with her shirts. I guess I pissed off the universe recently? One of my help desk guys was doing a RAM upgrade for a non-critical computer. He was sure to have it unplugged and grounded himself to the desktop, had the motherboard level, etc. Swapped out the RAM, no video. Repeated, no video. Placed an original RAM, no video? He came and got me at that point. We tried a few different sticks, still no video. Took out the RAM completely, no video, no post. Repeated CMOS, no video. Look for old GPUs we have on hand. Nothing with a form factor that fit the machine. This is at our workbench now, so new monitor, new video cables, new power cable, different physical station. Out of desperation, I figured, eh, it's onboard video. Let's take a peek at the CPU. Took off the cooler, there's little to no thermal paste on it. Okay, not good, but likely unrelated to the current issue. I noticed some dust bunnies around the edge of the CPU, so we picked it up to inspect it, and it seemed fine. For good measure, and kind of without thinking, I said let's blow some air over the CPU contacts in case moving the machine, somehow I guess, lodged some dust over the contacts and is effing with the video. So he held it back a pretty long distance and gave it one quick spurt. And the plastic stick shot out and eviscerated some of the pins on the board. I think movement or static must have killed video on the board somehow, and it's also a pretty ancient machine. Due for an upgrade anyway, but I would have liked to figure out for sure what the issue could have been. I'm not sure what that could have been. Uh, like you said, I guess you said some of the pins might have been messed up, but it's hard to tell after whatever shot out of the air nozzle messed things up, I guess. But uh, I've never had anything physical fly off of the, my air nozzles. I did have a compressor set up once for more sensitive things, and I had an airline dryer on there and everything. I drained the tank every night, 
made sure that we weren't having any moisture issues and we we weren't we weren't having a bit of moisture issue with it it was initially set up for painting and doing clear coat work for cabinetry and stuff like that well one of the dryers i guess wasn't working right that day or that week and uh i put on my air blower and i did the smaller one so that i could you know work on a computer and uh i doused my tower with oily water the other thing I probably should have done was sprayed something else or sprayed in the air away from the computer for a couple minutes to uh, get rid of any moisture that would have been in the line. It really wasn't one of my finest moments. The Mysterious Mouse. I was assisting a coworker with a Mac ticket and he was using his Mac to remote in. While on the remote computer, I noticed he couldn't use the magic mouse to scroll like normal. I even tried it myself and the top of it gave me no response. We then noticed his own Mac gave the same response. We went into system preferences, mouse, and it gave minimal options, and I couldn't remember if there was supposed to be more or not. He wanted to get back to his ticket, so I let him and kind of forgot about it. Then after lunch, he mentioned to me he figured it out on his own. He went into Bluetooth, which claimed there were no Bluetooth devices connected. Despite the mouse working as a basic mouse and definitely being a wireless mouse, the charging port's on the bottom of these, so, I, so it can't be used if you plugged it in. But he manually connected it and the top part started working. I feel like we need more info on this story. Was it because it was getting low on charge? Supposedly you can't use it when it's plugged in, so plugging it in made it work? I'm a little confused, but that's not abnormal, so. I will say that I've had my wireless mice when the battery starts getting a little low go funky, like it won't respond when I slide across the surface, buttons, certain buttons may not respond, or it'll look like it's clicking, but nothing's actually opening. It's really weird. You would think if you noticed the little X highlighting that something would close and all that stuff, but for some reason it wouldn't. And as soon as I put a battery in, everything was fine. So go figure. As far as Macs go, I don't know anything about Macs. Kid, that wasn't our drop. Been a while since I spun a tail from my wireline days. Figured I'd talk about one of the times I was stuck training someone. This guy seemed all right. He was young, but seemed intelligent. Came across well-spoken and wasn't afraid to get his hands dirty. I wasn't experienced enough to realize that this was in itself a red flag I should have paid closer attention to. He was rather young though, so hereafter I'll refer to him, as I did in real life, as the kid. We roll up on a house to install a new service. Introduce the kid and myself to our customer, hands shaking all around, and we get the tour of the work. Of course they had old ass plan outside. So we got to rip and replace the NID, run a new drop, new Cat 5E home run, the works. Dude doesn't want his old cable wire. It was crap RG59 anyway, so we get to use it for pull string. Sweet. Now I've watched this guy replace three NIDs already, so I decided to let his little wings fly. I go inside to scout the layout and plan the Cat 5 run. It was easy to run wires to two locations for computers due to the crap coax, so I upsell the guy. Sweet, more time for the job and a few bucks on my check when he pays the bill. I go back outside and see the old NID on the ground and wires hanging off the side of the garage. Kid's walking up with a new NID in his hand and says, Yo, I think there might be a second ID in the garage. Hmm, odd, but not unheard of. Why? Oh, the drop wire went inside there. I cut it off here, but didn't go inside to dig it out yet. Alarm bells. I look. Kid, that wasn't our drop. We go inside and I ask to go to the garage. Customer waves me to the door. We go in and I point at the box mounted on the wall. You just cut their sprinkler system off. And I give him the stare. He goes white and starts twitching. <laughs> so what do you think you should do about it, I ask. Kid goes into full-blown panic mode. Do I have to pay to get it fixed? I decide to terrorize him a bit and say, No, the company will pay for it, but since you're new and in training, you might be fired. And since you're supposed to be under my watch, I'll probably be written up for letting you do it, if not fired myself. More panicking. I decide to relent a bit and say, but we have a chance. First, we go tell the customer what happened and why. Be honest, don't BS him. I step out of the way and gesture him to lead the way. Kid walks like he's at a funeral, but goes up to the customer. Uh, sir, I have to tell you something. I made a mistake. Customer looks up with an OF look on his face. Well, this can't be good. What happened? The kid tells the story. Customer says, well, that sucks. What are y'all going to do about it? The kid is silent. I step in. Sir, I can call my manager and we'll get a claim started to get it repaired as soon as we can. Or if you're willing, I have the equipment to splice in some replacement wire and a waterproof enclosure. I'll have it fixed and we'll get your new service going shortly. 
for my own sake as much as the kids, I hold my breath a little bit at this moment. He thinks, then says, well, if I don't like it, I'll just do a clean. All right, go ahead and fix it, but it better be clean. You got it, sir. Kid here is going to be inside soon to run a new wire as we talked about after he finishes up outside. I'll check on him periodically to make sure there are no more mistakes. We get to work. To fix the cut wire, I unplug the sprinkler controller, get a couple of DSL filter boxes. I always use them to replace boot NIDs to use as a splice box for IW. My box of ONT power wire and my personal soldering iron and stock of heat shrink tubing. Definitely not standard operating procedure, but I had it for repairing wires when replacement or a scotch lock wasn't appropriate. I drag my extension cord over, plug in my iron, and get to work. I've honestly never touched a sprinkler controller before, but I knew enough to know it's just a big ass switch. No sprinklers running meant no voltage on the wires. And that wire is wire. The remaining cable is too short to have enough slack to drill a new hole and pass it through to the garage, so I do two splices. I use ONT power wires as jumpers to splice the wire outside in a DSL box to go inside through the hole where the cut wire is. Using a drop guard to protect the previously unprotected cable, I used another DSL box as an enclosure on the inside of the garage to splice to the wire on the other side. Used my tone generator to be 100% certain I was matching color for color since each pair was red or black. Took a while with all the soldering and heat shrinking with my lighter, but I got it done and it was clean AF. Yes, looking back, I probably could have done it another way easier, but at the time, all I cared about was making it look pretty. I kept checking on the kid. He was absolutely on his best behavior and honestly doing the best work I had seen. Punch downs were perfect on the wall jacks and at the RG location, he bundled the cables together neatly to the desk location. Once I was done, after poking at the analog switch controller, figuring out how it worked, I powered it back up and tested turning on the sprinklers. Thankfully, it worked. Big sigh of relief. I finished up the real reason I was there, job, with the trainee and verified everything. Three TVs and two computers were happily connected to our service. We run through the service demo. I, of course, made the kid do it. Once we were done and our customer was happy, I took him to see my repair work. Well, of course, there are more boxes on my house, but I imagine short of digging up the wire, that's probably the best anyone could have done. Thanks for making it right without putting me through a lot of trouble. We shook hands all around again. Yes, even the kid got a good handshake. I left him my number in case he had any issues and we moved on. Never got a repeat out of that job. I told my manager what happened, since I'm that honest guy, and he laughed. I'd have just used scotch locks. Kid grew to be pretty damn good tech. When I quit, he was a union steward and had been taking some of the chronic repair jobs I had been doing for way too long and was resolving them. Made me happy. Also, one night when we'd both happened to roll into the shop at the same time, he invited me out for a beer and paid the tab. I considered that paid up in full. We've all dropped the ball at some point. I was glad I helped him get over his mistake to grow to be a damn good tech, and how to handle his mistakes with integrity, even though that time he had me to bail his ass out. Yep, we've all made mistakes. We'll continue to make mistakes because we're human. Sometimes we are moving faster than our brains can keep up with. Sometimes our brains aren't working at all. Oh, look. Dimey. <laughs> I haven't done a lot of splicing work or wire work or anything like that. Uh, I ran some Cat5... E Hello? I've ran some Cat5 e-cable for our church a long time ago. Uh, bought a little punch-down kit and learned how to put the ends on myself and everything. Where everything was terminated with the routers and stuff like that, I would put a nice clean sheet of plywood on the wall staple everything nice and neat and label everything so we knew where it was going and yeah i mean i try to make things neat and look pretty excuse me excuse me you're standing on my keyboard <laughs> cat come on you don't know what you want get up there <laughs> get up <over> there <laughs> oh god Anyway, but I like this guy's idea of, you know, owning your mistakes with integrity. If you goofed, say you goofed and make it right. And nine times out of ten, you're not going to get in any trouble or get fired. Now, if it's something that happens over and over and over again, yeah, eventually you're just going to get let go because it, you're too much of a liability at that point. Hey, guys, YouTube thinks you're going to like this video right here. So uh, do me a favor and help out the channel and give it a click. Besides, it makes Dimey happy. See ya. Say bye.